Hi, in this third and final clip on the use of force, I would like to discuss grounds not covered in the UN Charter, namely intervention by invitation, humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect. I will focus primarily on the latter two, but I do want to start this clip by talking about intervention by invitation, something that has become increasingly salient in the recent years. In the previous clip I already mentioned that Article 51 allows for the possibility of collective self-defense. So as a defending state you can call upon your allies, you can use your military alliances to repel the armed attack by another state. Now what happens if there is internal opposition, if there are rebel and insurgent groups that try to overthrow a government and take control of a state? Is it still possible to invite your allies to assist you in fending off such an internal domestic attack. The notion of intervention by invitation raises a number of difficult questions for international law and it does so because it basically puts against each other two fundamental principles of international law. On the one hand, of course, we have the state consent principle where states are free to make all kinds of arrangements with other states and that arguably includes inviting another state to come to its aid when it comes to fighting internal opposition, if it so pleases. On the other hand, we have the non-interference principle, where states are not supposed to meddle in the domestic internal affairs of another state, notably because all states are, of course, sovereign within their own jurisdiction. We can imagine how the idea of intervention by invitation runs quite quickly against this idea of non-interference, particularly where the aiding state simply pretends to have been invited, for example, by a government that it has itself installed or that is not anymore in power. Whether intervention by invitation is an option, and in certain cases it definitely will be, therefore depends on who has extended the invitation, who is the entity that does the inviting here. And under international law as it currently stands, the answer to this question, whether a government is actually legitimized to extend such an invitation, will very much depend on whether it exercises effective control over the state in question. It is fair to say that state practice has evolved here in recent years and that more states extend but also accept such invitations, thereby making intervention by invitation more and more common. Some examples to mention here are the Russian involvement in Syria, the Ugandan involvement in South Sudan, but also France's military assistance to the state of Mali in its fight against terrorists within its territory. Another justification for intervention not mentioned in the UN Charter, but one for which we arguably have a more straightforward legal assessment, is humanitarian intervention. What's in the name? Humanitarian, well, because it is a response to gross and systematic violations of human rights norms. Genocide, crimes against humanity, large-scale atrocities perpetrated against innocent civilian populations. And a military intervention that goes by the name of humanitarian intervention seeks to either stop or even prevent such atrocities from even happening. There is a long tradition in just world theory, in political philosophy, in political theory, that grounds the use ad bellum in such humanitarian considerations, discussing when they can be invoked and under what circumstances such an invitation would be acceptable. But these obviously are political and moral questions and not really of relevance for our legal assessment, because under international law, in fact, humanitarian intervention is not permitted. The legal state of affairs is as clear as it is because under international law, humanitarian intervention describes a sort of residual category of actions that do not actually find any legal justification in some of the other notable exceptions to Article 2.4 that I have discussed so far. Think, for example, of a Security Council resolution, which might very well be motivated by concern for the protection of innocent human lives. But in this case, it is really the fact that the Security Council took measures under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter that legitimizes the use of force, not the motives that underlie this taking of this resolution. If the intervention receives the consent of the state in which it takes place, well, then it's an instance of collective self-defense or indeed intervention by invitation. And once again, it will be the consent of states that determines the lawfulness of the intervention in question, not the humanitarian motive that underlies it and that from a legal point of view is actually completely irrelevant. None of this is changed by the fact that one could put forward some international law arguments in favor of humanitarian intervention, relying for example on human rights law such as the right to life or the prohibition of torture and inhumane degrading treatment, as well as the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law. But at the end of the day, 
the prohibition of the use of force is the cornerstone of the modern international legal system and the United Nations, as we have seen, is in place precisely to formulate very specific exceptions and to thereby avoid, thereby prevent any abuse, in particular by powerful states, of any possible justification, such as humanitarian intervention, to then intervene in the affairs of other states. The prime example of humanitarian intervention is the 1999 intervention by NATO in Kosovo. At that time, Serbian military forces were engaging in an ethnic cleansing operation, seeking to remove ethnic Albanians from what was at that point still considered to be Serbian territory, and NATO intervened, notably through airstrikes, to put pressure on the Serbian government to stop this campaign. What's important to note here is that NATO's military operation at the time had not received any authorization by the UN Security Council, which came to endorse the campaign and the outcomes only afterwards. But most international legal scholars agree that such ex post authorization by the Security Council is not sufficient and that therefore the NATO intervention in Kosovo actually was a breach of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter because once again any exception to this prohibition must be construed narrowly. The controversy surrounding Kosovo provided the international community with some impetus to reopen the discussion, to consider whether the UN Charter had not actually overlooked an important instance and whether Article 2.4 was not perhaps too restrictive in not allowing for there to be a humanitarian ground that could indeed be invoked where there were gross large-scale violations of human rights and where civilian populations had to be protected, such as in the case of Kosovo. As a result, a group of legal experts, the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, was created and tasked with looking into these thorny questions and potentially propose some measures for reform. Its report on the responsibility to protect, or in short R2P, was then considered during the 2005 UN World Summit in which states came to endorse some of its main propositions and principles. Specifically, the responsibility to protect found mentioned in two paragraphs of the document that was adopted at the end of this World Summit, with the first one stating that, and I quote, each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, end quote. And this paragraph shows that, as opposed to earlier times perhaps, State sovereignty was not anymore considered to be absolute and that in fact a state has a responsibility for the well-being of its populations and specifically for avoiding any kind of mass atrocities from occurring on its territory. But what happens when a state breaches its primary responsibility to take care of its populations? This was addressed in a second relevant paragraph of the World Summit document discussing R2P, which establishes, and once again I quote, the international community through the United Nations also has the responsibility in accordance with chapters 6 and 8 of the Charter to help to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. And this is a relevant finding because for the first time in fact the international community was also found to be responsible and in particular responsible when in fact the state failed to live up to the primary responsibility that it holds. However, what this provision does not do is upend the UN Charter system as we currently know it. For a state and the international community to divest their responsibility to protect, they still have to be in line with all the things, all the norms that we have mentioned in this clip so far, and most notably with the United Nations system and the prohibition on the use of force and these exceptions, including the self-defense exception and the mandate by the UN Security Council under Chapter 7. In short, at the end of the day, nothing much had changed when it came to the legal norms on the prohibition of the use of force. And in fact, R2P was invoked only once, namely when it came to the intervention in Libya. And in this case, it was the UN Security Council that relied on it, but also invoked Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. So therefore falling squarely within the exception that we discussed in the first clip. This concludes the videos on the use of force. I look forward to discussing the prohibition, its exceptions, the UN system and humanitarian intervention with you in class.